it's a great pleasure to be here. As, as Marie said, my day job is being President and Vice Chancellor of the University of New South Wales. It's a massive privilege. But my background is in medicine as a cancer surgeon and researcher for many years. And what I'm going to talk to you about today is something that I've worked on for 30 years. I'm going to talk to you about a very specific thing. Early detection and screening for cancer of the ovary in the general population of women. And I'm going to talk to you, as Marie hinted, about a very, very large trial. In fact, one of the largest trials ever conducted, which has just reported on mortality in the Lancet in December. So this is it's very current, but it's a 30-year research program. I do need to declare some interests. And the first is that I am an eternal optimist. No one would have been crazy enough to get involved in this work 30 years ago without being an eternal optimist. And in this context, I am optimistic that ovarian cancer screening, early detection, will work and will save many lives. I've been working on it for 30 years. I do have a financial interest now because universities commercialize their work and I'm a non-executive director, shareholder, and a paid consultant to a company which is involved in, in commercializing the screening tests and I'm co-inventor of a patent which has been licensed. So I do have a financial interest as well as being an eternal optimist. So you can treat everything else I'm going to say to you now with complete skepticism. But nevertheless, I'll say it and I'll try and enthuse all of you. And, and you, why, why am I so passionate about ovarian cancer? Well, you, you just heard about pancreatic cancer. Actually, there's one cancer that is worse in terms of outcomes than ovarian cancer. It really is pancreatic cancer. But ovarian cancer is still pretty awful. And over... Here, you have the um, survival rates for ovarian cancer over time. And you can see it's hardly improved. There's a little bit of improvement, but the five of women who develop ovarian cancer, around 40% will still be alive five years later. And that hasn't changed much since the 1970s. You can see that for cancers overall, this is for all sites of cancer, they're that the overall survival rates of five years are better and they've improved much more than for ovarian cancer. So there is still a massive problem with ovarian cancer. It causes enormous suffering. It is the fourth commonest cause of death from cancer amongst women in Australia, in the UK, in the USA, and most of the developed world. A little bit more about the challenge of ovarian cancer. Ovarian cancer can be split into four, essentially four stages. Stage one is when the cancer is confined to the ovary. Stage two is spread to the pelvis, stage three more widespread and in the abdomen, and stage four it's even further spread. And the key point of this slide is to show you that for stage one, relatively few women are diagnosed with stage one at the moment, about 15%, the blue bar. They have a really good prognosis. 90% or more will be alive and well at five years. And then it tails off. The majority of women have stage 3 or 4 disease. Their five-year survival rate, the red bars here, are very poor. So basically, there is a currently a five-year survival rate of about 40%. Most patients have advanced stage disease by the time they're diagnosed, and they have a terrible prognosis, and there is enormous suffering associated with this. So the idea of screening is that if you could shift some of those women from the previous slide, who have stage 2, 3, or 4 disease, if you could shift them to earlier stage disease by detecting them by screening, and if they had the same survival rates per stage, then you'd get overall 60% plus, perhaps, survival rate. So the idea is to pick up the cancer early in the hope that the women who are picked up early will have the same survival rates as we get now for the very small proportion of women who are picked up early enough. Now, there are all sorts of ifs and buts about that, because it may be that the disease you're picking up earlier behaves in a different way, even though you've picked it up early. So the only way that you can answer the question, will it work? Well, first of all, you've got to have the test to do it. And secondly, then, the only way you can answer the question, will it work, is to do a randomized controlled trial. That is, some women you screen, and some women you don't screen, and you follow them up, and you look to see whether the overall survival rates and 
deaths are less in the screen group compared to the control group. In order to justify doing that randomized controlled trial, you have to do a ton of work first to give the people who are going to fund the trial some prospect that this is likely to work. And what this slide just shows is that this program of work began in the 1980s. I started this when I was a, a junior doctor doing research at the Royal London Hospital, and I've pursued it ever since for 30 years. And I hope that by 2020, we will have a positive answer and be able to show that this makes a difference. And in between, there is a very, very long story, which could, I could, the, the, um, the magical mystery tour of ovarian cancer screening, I could easily speak to you for three hours. I need to finish in 10 minutes in order to be within my, or 10 or 12 minutes to be within my time. So I'm not going to take you through all of this, but I do want to give you some of the highlights why I am still optimistic that this might work. In the trial that you have to do has to be very large because it's got to give you, sadly, it's got to give you enough deaths in the control group who are not screened that you can compare it and see a significant decrease in the groups who are screened. And we calculated that to do a trial big enough needed to involve over 200,000 women. And this trial, that's why this is because of ovarian cancer, albeit it causes, it's the fourth commonest cause of death from cancer amongst women. Cancer, fortunately, is still relatively uncommon. And you're starting by recruiting people, a healthy population, and we calculated you need 200,000 women. And this trial is one of the largest prospective trials ever conducted in any area of medicine in any part of the world. 200,000 women in the UK, over 50 and postmenopausal. Why over 50 and postmenopausal? It's because that's the age group where ovarian cancer most commonly occurs. And we randomized them to three groups. A control group of 100,000. All they did was say they'd take part and agree to be followed up. No screening. A second group screened with ultrasound. The same sort of ultrasound as is used in... Um, gynecology and obstetrics, except that we're looking at postmenopausal ovaries, which are pretty small. They're about that big. This is a very skilled ultrasound, but nevertheless, it is still ultrasound. The ultrasound approach is through the vagina, transvaginal ultrasound, not, not abdominal ultrasound. And then the third approach uses a blood test, which I'll tell you a little bit more about, called CA125, in a risk of ovarian cancer algorithm. And the end point of the study was to see, did we decrease mortality but also, importantly, if you're doing this sort of intervention in a population, you need to be sure about what morbidity do you cause by the interventions related to screening. What are the health economics? What are the quality of life acceptability and compliance issues? How sensitive is the test? And all sorts of other things. There's one other study of ovarian cancer screening, one other randomized trial of ovarian cancer screening performed by the National Institute of Health in the USA which reported in 2011. This is the depressing results of that trial. The, the dotted line is the control group. This is the, um, this is the proportion surviving. And the dotted line is the control group. And the solid line is the screen group. And you can see there's no difference. There are reasons that that trial didn't work. They didn't have as sophisticated a screening test. They didn't use it in a carefully quality controlled way. But it's a pretty depressing start to my talk. That was the trial from the USA. The prostate, lung, colon, ovary study. There are important differences in some of the, in the sensitivity of screening and the stage shift of screening in that trial to the UKC Cox trial, which I'll just, as a teaser, show you now. And just to point out that in the PLCO study that didn't work, it only picked up 51.7% of the cancers in, compared to 86.8% in the UKC Cox trial, the UK trial. And there was more of a stage shift in the UK trial, 39% early stage compared to just 15%. So a hint there that there may be a difference between the American trial and the UKC Cox. So that's the trial design. These are the people who coordinated it, and I'll just show you them to... I should mention my colleague Usha Menon, who has spent the last 15 years living and breathing this trial. It was conducted in 
coordinated at University College London, but conducted in 13 centres around the UK, which I've shown there. Recruitment occurred from 2001 to 2005, and screening went on from 2001 to 2012. This is a very long trial, and we've just reported the first mortality results. These are the um, collaborated centres. Now, part of this story is about assembling the jigsaw of ovarian cancer screening. Acceptability, compliance, specificity, complication rate, sensitivity, stage shift, and then mortality reduction, and then we get on to whether the health is useful or not as well. And part of the reason for showing you this is not just in relation to ovarian cancer, but to give you a sense of just how challenging it is to put together evidence to convince health agencies around the world that a screening program like this, a health intervention, would work and would be worth doing. In the ultrasound arm of the study, the women came along every year, the 50,000 women in the ultrasound arm, and they had a scan. If it was normal, they just came back next year. If it was abnormal, they had another scan, and if that was abnormal, they went on to a clinical opinion and possibly surgery. And then in the middle, there were some unsatisfactory ones where people had to have repeat ultrasounds until they became normal or abnormal. And, and the, the criteria for interpreting the ultrasound was the appearance of the ovary, the morphology of the ovary. It's not just the size, it's whether there are septi in a, septi in a cyst dividing up the ovary and whether there are solid areas in the wall of a cyst. So it's quite a sophisticated approach to ultrasound. In the other arm of the study, the multimodal arm relied on a blood test, a blood test called CA125. And it wasn't just measuring the blood test as to whether it was above or below a threshold. Really importantly, it was looking, interpreting the results of this test over time. And women who are abnormal have a rising level of CA125. Women who are normal have a flat or falling level of CA125. And again, if it was normal, they came back in a year. If it was abnormal, they went on to an ultrasound, and if that was abnormal, a clinical opinion and surgery. And if it was intermediate, they went round and round until they became normal or abnormal. This is just to show you how this algorithm works. Women who do not have a varying cancer, but have a raised level of the CA125 blood test, have either flat levels over time or falling levels over time. Whereas women who do have ovarian cancer have exponentially rising levels of CA125 as shown here. And what the algorithm does is to compare any one individual's pattern of CA125 over time to all the data from thousands of women that we have in the database. And it produces a percentage risk that that woman has ovarian cancer. And it's called the risk of ovarian cancer algorithm. So it uses CA125 to determine a woman's risk. Recruitment, 2001 to 5. Screening, 2001 to 12. 2.19 million women years of follow-up in this enormous study. And the study has put together all of this information, so I'm going to quickly run you through. So first of all, was it acceptable and did women comply with this screening program? The answer is yes, and I'll just draw your attention to this side of the diagram. In the multimodal arm, over 14 years, 81% of women in that arm complied, which is pretty extraordinary. And in the ultrasound arm, 78%. So yes, women do find it acceptable and they will comply with this sort of screening. Were there too many false positives? Because if you have a false positive, a woman would have unnecessary surgery and that can cause complications and pretty serious things and cause expense and cost as well. And those are a interpreted as specificity and positivity value. I won't bore you too much with the detail of what they mean, but this is what we needed to achieve to have an acceptable screening test. We needed 99.6% of women who were healthy and did not have ovarian cancer to have a normal test. We needed less than 10% of the operations we did, greater than 10% of the operations we did to be for ovarian cancer rather than for false positives. And we needed to have less than 10 operations per ovarian cancer detected. And this is what we found. Um, the multimodal arm achieved those criteria. Just four operations per case of ovarian cancer detected. The ultrasound arm wasn't quite 
in the target, there were 17 operations for each of their individual detectors. But the bottom line here is that the multimodal arm has very, very, very high specificity. It's very good at distinguishing normal from abnormal, 99.84%. What about the complication rate? Because if there was a big complication rate of screening, this would be a no, no play. And the answer here is that for the ultrasound arm, out of 327,000 screens, there were 1,600 false positive operations, but there were just 57 significant complications. And that meant that for every screen, the number of screens for one complication in the ultrasound arm was 5,700, which is pretty good. But in the multimodal arm, it's even more impressive. There were just 488 false positive operations, just 15 significant complications from those operations, and 23,000 screens per complication. So we're in a space here where it is, there are not too many false positives, the number of complications is low, and it, we're in an acceptable range. Of course, all that's a waste of time if we're not picking up cancer. And that sensitivity is a measure of what proportion of the cancers did we pick up. And the data here is very different between the multimodal and ultrasound arms. And actually, when we began the trial, people thought the ultrasound arm would be the one that would be most sensitive, because you could see the ovary. It turns out that the multimodal arm is much more sensitive. And um, the sensitivity, the proportion of cancers that the screening test picks up within a year of the screen, for the multimodal arm is 86%, which is good by any standard. It's good by the standards of breast cancer screening or cervical cancer screening. For the ultrasound arm, it's not disastrous, but it's only 63%, so not quite as good. So the multimodal arm is looking better. It's got higher acceptability, lower false positive rate, lower complication rate, and higher sensitivity. What about stage shift? Because we're not going to be very hopeful that this makes a difference if we don't shift the stage to the earlier stages. And the answer here is that in the control group, the women who weren't screened, 24% had stage 1 and 2, early stage, and 26% had low volume disease, which is favorable disease. In the, in the multimodal arm, that 23%, 24% was increased to 36% for early stage, and 26 to 40% for low volume disease. Not quite, whoops, not quite as um, encouraging in the ultrasound arm. So again, the multimodal arm looks better. And this is just another way of showing that stage shift. The multimodal arm in blue looks better than the ultrasound arm. We also have evidence that we're pushing back the time that we're diagnosing the cancers. And I'm not going to explain all this in detail except to, to tell you that the data suggests that we're getting 2.2 to 2.5 years lead time over when the cancer would have been detected in the multimodal arm, and about 1.6 to 2.2 years in the ultrasound arm. So that's all encouraging. And then the big question. When you put all this together, we've got a test which is acceptable, there's compliance, there's a low false positive rate, low complication rate, and it's sensitive, and it shifts the stage, and it has lead time. Does it reduce mortality? That's the big question. We published this in The Lancet last year. That's to remind you of the PLCO data. And this is the data from UKC Tom. This is the primary analysis. So I'm going to show you several analyses. And the key thing is that, of course, it takes time for a benefit to emerge because you're taking a screening population of healthy women. They've got to develop cancer, some of them, and then die from the cancer before you could possibly see a difference. So the difference only emerges towards the end of the trial. And it is now beginning to emerge. And this is the deaths, the mortality, the deaths in the control group. And this here are the deaths in the screen groups. In the multimodal group, 15% mortality reduction. And in the ultrasound group, an 11% mortality reduction. Now, this is the primary analysis. And if you're a statistical purist, you will see that P is not less than 0.005. So this did not reach statistical significance on the primary analysis. It may well do because there is further follow-up going on for another three years. The trend all looks in the right direction. It looks as if the deaths in the control group are still increasing and they're flattening off in the screen group. So I'm 
being the eternal optimist, I'm optimistic that as time goes by, it will show a, a, a significant difference. But there's some other data that I do need to quickly show you, and that is other statistical analyses. This all gets pretty controversial, but it's worth just showing you. It depends, because this is borderline at the moment, it depends on what statistical test you use. And if you use another test called the Royston Palmer test, which divides the screen effect into the first seven years and the last seven years, what you see importantly here is that the effect in the last seven years, seven to 14 years, is a 23% reduction in mortality with confidence intervals between one and 46%. So it starts to look very interesting in those last seven years. For ultrasound, that was for the multimodal study. A similar effect for ultrasound, but less powerful, 21% in the last seven years. If you use another test, the weighted log rate test, which is particularly designed to look at differences which change across the course of the trial, then you do get a significant reduction in mortality, less than 0.05. And it's from 3% to 38%, average 22%. So it's very encouraging. The reason this test is important is because this test was used in that American study, which showed a negative result. So they used the same test in the American study, it was negative, and in, in, in this study, it does show a positive result. And that's the result for ultrasound, which doesn't quite reach significance. There's another analysis if you remove the prevalent cases of cancer, the cases of cancer that were in the population at the beginning, when the women were recruited, so they couldn't be affected by screening, and when you do that, you get an even bigger effect. This is the long-term effect of screening, 28% at 7 to 14 years. So it's beginning, if you do this analysis, to look encouraging. And this is just summarizing all of the mortality analyses. So no effect would be at zero here. A, a reduction is over this side, an increase is at this side. The red dots show the average per test, and the bars show the 95% confidence interval. And the bottom line is that it's not conclusive yet, but it looks encouraging. It looks as though it's moving in the right direction. And most of these results are well to the right-hand side of zero for the multimodal arm. And they are to the right-hand side of zero for ultrasound, but not quite as convincing. Cost-effectiveness, we haven't got the data yet, but I can tell you that at 13.8 years, the number needed to screen to prevent the number of women needed to screen to prevent one death from ovarian cancer was 641. So that begins to tell you how it might work out in terms of health economics. Again, at the moment, it's borderline. It's probably just about okay, but it's still in the borderline area. So that's the story. We've put together this jigsaw puzzle of ovarian cancer screening over 30 years. In summary, I would say that the multimodal strategy achieves high compliance, better performance, the specificity, positive predictive value, complication rate, sensitivity, and state shift than ultrasound and than any other test, as well as the most encouraging evidence of a mortality benefit. We need to follow up for another two to three years to determine the scale of the mortality benefit. And as an opt eternal optimist, this is where I think we'll end up in 2020. We will probably by then, using the great work that's going on in the Garvin and other places, be able to assess a woman's risk using genetics and acquired factors and stratify women into various risk groups. The high risk population, five to 15% of the population, 30% of the cases will have preventative strategies and screening of some type. The intermediate risk group, 25 to 35% of the population, about 60% of cases will have screening. And there'll be a low risk group which hopefully will be as much as 50 to 70% of the population, containing just 10% of cases where the risk is so low, it will say, don't bother with screening, don't bother with prevention, your risk is much greater for other things. And um, the screening will be performed with some sort of a varying cancer screening algorithm using the CA125 blood test, but probably other blood tests that are now being worked on at the moment. And hopefully, it'll be enough to achieve a mortality reduction even greater than suggested by the UKC top class of 40 to 60 percent. These are the funding agencies who put 50 million pounds into this trial over all this period of time. I'm really grateful to them. This is the coordinating group, trial steering committee, the, the, um, the other 
uh, participants. And of course, uh, as Amber said, none of this would be possible without the people who participate in these sorts of trials. So I'm incredibly grateful to, to the 202,638 women who gave their time to this trial over 15 years. Thanks very much for listening.